Thank you for joining us at Community On Demand. Moses instituted seven national holidays that literally pointed to the coming Messiah who would make the ultimate sacrifice for them and for us. Some wonder if these holidays have prophetic implications. Today, Pastor Dan begins a seven-part series called Celebrate Jesus to show how each of the seven Jewish holidays point to the Messiah. Dan begins the series this week with Israel's Declaration of Independence, the Jewish holiday called the Passover. This message was recorded during a live Sunday morning service at Community. Let's listen in as Dan begins. You know, this past year, um, New York City hosted the 40th annual Macy's 4th of July fireworks show. Now, it lasted about 30 minutes, and it cost about $100,000. Um, and uh, the, the, I don't know if you really uh, know the mechanics of all of it, but the, the fireworks were launched from five barges that were anchored in the East River somewhere between 23rd and 34th Street. Um, so you could watch, if you were in New York, you could watch the fireworks show from the 86th floor of the Empire State Building for $500. Now, now that included hors d'oeuvres and drinks. And, um, uh, you know, and, and so that, that was one option. Another option was that you could observe the fireworks show from the One World Observatory. You say, what is that? That is the former uh, World Trade Towers. Now, you, you, could, you could observe it from there for $350. Bring your own hors d'oeuvres, okay? Or... You could observe it from the Summit Building for $300 per person. Gala and I observed it from our living room couch for free. And probably got just the same thrill that everybody else did. But, but on that day, it is estimated that 3 million people watched the fireworks show in New York City, and about 5 million watched it uh, across the country on television. At the same time, there were all kinds of fireworks shows going on. One right here in the, uh, in the Woodlands and countless uh, fireworks uh, were, were going on on that day at dusk to celebrate the July 4th, 1776 Declaration of Independence. We all know that. That's not great news. We know that. However, in all of the celebration. I don't remember anything being mentioned about the sacrifice of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence. Now, in case you didn't know, I would like to go ahead and talk about them for just a couple of moments this morning. You might not know that five of the signers were captured by the British and tortured before they were put to death. Twelve of the signers of the Declaration of Independence had their houses ransacked and burned to the ground. Two of the signers of the the Declaration lost their sons in the uh, Revolutionary War, and two had their sons captured uh, and held prisoners uh, by the British soldiers. Nine of the 56 signers fought and died of their wounds or hardships uh, in the Revolutionary War. Now, when I mention the lack of appreciation for those celebrating the 4th of July parade, and the lack of appreciation for these 56 signers, I must admit that um, I'm, I've been guilty of the same. One year, Gail and I actually were able to watch the Woodlands 4th of July parade from or fireworks show from the mezzanine of the Marriott Waterway Hotel. Oh, that was nice. There, there we, they, we, there they served free hors d'oeuvres, you know, and, 
and, and, and we, got to, we got to sit there, and we enjoyed the free food. We enjoyed good company, great view, and 70 degree temperature while everyone else was sweltering down on the ground, you know. And you know what? Not once during that experience did I think of the incredible cost of the signers of the Declaration of Independence that afforded me the privilege to be sitting there in that swanky hotel watching the fireworks and enjoying the liberty that I enjoy here in the United States of America. You know, folks, as American Christians, we are the most privileged people on the planet. Amen. We are. I mean, we may think we've got it bad right now, but we're incredibly, incredibly privileged. Uh, and, and the reason for it is because of the extreme sacrifice of our forefathers. Uh, we, we enjoy a freedom that is unimaginable in other parts of the world. I think about a niece sitting over in Pakistan right now and everything that's going on over there and us sitting here in the air-conditioned building right here. It, it, it's, it, we, we just enjoy so much. And, and, and so we enjoy this because of the sacrifice of our forefathers, but also on top of that, we can enjoy the emotional and spiritual freedom here on earth plus eternal freedom in, in the life to come because of the sacrifice of our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. We've just got it great. We, we, when we celebrate the 4th of July, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, all of these holidays, it is imperative that we stop for a moment and think about what sacrifice was made by our God that we might be able to celebrate such a thing. And not only that, and here's where we've really failed, we've got to communicate that to our children and our grandchildren or else they're not going to appreciate it and we're going to lose it all. That's where we are today. In the book of Exodus, Israel was a slave nation. And, and after a while, they were set free. They were a slave nation that was set free. And when we come to chapter 12, God began instituting national holidays to help them and their children remember the cost of their freedom. And, and, and as they celebrated and remembered that, that they were free, it could impact them so that they could remain free. And in fact, what he did is he instituted seven different holidays in all. And when we come to the New Testament, we discover that these holidays literally celebrated Jesus. Or they do celebrate Jesus. And in the first holiday, as, as we were talking about a moment ago, we're going to talk about, the, uh, about Passover and and we're going to take a look at it and how it celebrates Jesus. And in this celebration, what we'll notice is that we will discover that there is a relationship, a release, and a revelation all about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So let's kind of dig into the passage. Turn to Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 3. First of all, we'll see that it really relates to sacrifice. It's kind of a long passage of scripture here, so let me just read. You can read it on the screen if you don't have it there in your Bible, or you can turn there. Exodus chapter three, uh, 12 and verse number 3. Uh, so God has given this, uh, the, the prescription for this holiday to Moses. And he says, on the tenth day of the month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of that same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the, uh, of the houses where they shall eat it. Then... They shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Now, did you get that? 
Israel, on that first Passover, was instructed that every family was to go to the flock and take a yearling, an innocent little lamb, watch it for five days, and then slaughter the lamb, smear the blood on the door jam. And the thing about this little yearling lamb was that it was innocent, had done no wrong. Let's read on. Skip down to verse 23. For the Lord will pass through and strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and the doorpost, the Lord will pass over. That's where we get the name Passover. The Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. You know, the first time in history that a little innocent lamb was slaughtered for sin was way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. I'll try to imagine that day, of course, Adam and Eve had fallen. They were ashamed. They were running from the Lord. They were blaming one another for disobedience. And, and, um, and then the Lord in, in, chapter, in chapter 3, verse 21, does something. And we read, he just, he said, it says, he clothed them in, in, in animal skins or in skins. That was the first death in history. Where that a little lamb, maybe a pet lamb, a lamb that Adam had named had to be slaughtered and then they had to be covered to ever remind them of the cost of their salvation. You know, go back to this night on Passover. I would estimate that there were about 500,000 households in Israel. We get that number a little bit later on. But about 500,000 houses in Israel on that, that day, that Nisan, uh, 1415, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the day there, um, in, in about four, 1400 B.C. And so when you do the math, we, 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 we kind of skip this. When you do the math on that night, on that very first Passover night, there were probably a half a million little lambs slain for sacrifice. And so the first thing that Passover does is it relates to sacrifice. Of course, it's going to be pointing to the sacrifice of Christ. The second thing it does is it released them from slavery. Uh, Verse number 50. Thus all of the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did, and it came to pass that on that very same day that the Lord brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. We know the story. The night following the Passover meal, Israel received their emancipation proclamation. They received their declaration of independence because Pharaoh came in the night and said, you're free. Get out of town. Go worship your God. Go to the promised land. In fact, we'll help finance it. Go. And he freed them on that night. And and during the Passover holiday, they were supposed to eat bitter herbs. You might wonder what that is. Probably horseradish. I'm just researching. And unleavened bread. uh, The horseradish or the bitter herbs to remind them of the bitterness of slavery and the, bitter, and the grief and the bitterness of the slaughtered lamb. The, the, um, the unleavened bread uh, to show them the urgency of salvation. Hurry. Uh, don't, don't wait around. And, and, uh, and, and then, of course, they were freed. I think there's some picture, some, some uh, typology going on here. As we look at the story, we see uh, that that we can relate to Egypt is a picture of the world that enslaves us to sin. I mean, it really happened. But but it's a picture of the world that enslaves us to sin. The Passover lamb pictures Christ that was sacrificed for the sins of the world. And of course, Israel pictures people that have been freed from uh, the penalty of sin because of salvation by faith in the Lamb of God. So 
so there's, there's things going on uh, as, we, as we look at the Passover. It, it related to sacrifice. It, it released them from slavery. And finally, it reveals the Savior. Uh, in, in Numbers chapter 9, skip it over to Numbers. In verse number 1, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the children of Israel keep the Passover at its appointed time on the 14th day of the month. Now, a lot of historians go back and date the Exodus at about 1446 B.C. And here we have this date of Nisan. It's not the car, okay? It's, it's, it's a month. Or Abed, or we might see it as April, March, around, and it's 14th. Why do you say 14th, 15th? It's because the Israelis, their calendar, they would, they would begin, and they would end each day at 6, <clears throat> and then... And, and so on the 14th, getting a little complex here, on the 14th at 6 o'clock in the evening, it was also the 15th. It would just go around. So on that day, that's when the Passover happened. Over 14 centuries later, something spectacular that no one expected happened in Israel. Unbelievably extraordinary. Let me read it to you as we jump to John chapter 18, verse 28. It says, and they, who is the they? The Jewish leaders that arrested Jesus. And they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. And it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Do you see what day it is? Jesus was, a, was arrested by the high priest, examined all night. Get the picture? Then he was taken like a lamb and slaughtered as the Passover on Passover day, crucified on the cross for the sin of the world on Passover. See how it all fits together? All Passover celebrations pointed to the coming Messiah, Jesus, who would be crucified on the cross for the sins of the world. The countless number of Passover lambs that were sacrificed were saying, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, the Lamb of God is coming, and then he came on this date, and was sacrificed. And he came on this date, and rather than celebrating Jesus, they crucified Jesus. That's the story of Passover. You say, well, how, how, how does that, how do we connect to the Passover? We're Gentiles. We don't really celebrate Passover. Should we celebrate Passover? How do we make the connection between the killing of that lamb and the crucifixion of the Lord? I think there are a few ways as we, that we can make personal application and in that celebrate Jesus. Let me suggest about three things. Number one, we must re- respond to him as our Passover sacrifice. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, it says, For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. See, we no longer have to go down to the, to the, to the temple. Take our, we no longer have to go out and get a lamb, examine it, take it down to the temple, have them slaughter it, catch the blood, take it back to our house, put it on the door frame, walk in. We don't have to do that anymore. Why? Because Christ was our Passover. He was sacrificed for our sins. All we must do now is believe in Him, trust in Him. He is our Savior. He is our Passover Lamb. 
Jesus is God's lamb who was slaughtered on the cross to save us and to set us free. In fact, uh, John the Baptist declared that on the day that, that Christ came in and, and was baptized. In fact, on, in John 1, 29, John looks at him and says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, I, 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 I try to calculate, I try to think of things, you know. So I started thinking about, okay, about 500,000 households about 500,000 lambs for about 14 centuries. I mean, it's incalculable how many lambs were sacrificed, which is trying to demonstrate the incalculable cost of the sacrifice of God's only Son. Can you grasp it? I mean, for, for, for the Lord Jesus Christ... To give himself and for God the Father to allow his son to be sacrificed on the cross. It's immeasurable. The thought, the grief. I mean, sometimes I, I say, God, how, how in the world could you possibly do that? I, I, I think about my own kids and grandkids. How can you do that? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. When we begin to understand that Jesus is the Passover lamb. He was crucified so that we might receive the gift of salvation, live abundant on earth, live eternally in heaven with him. You know what it does for us? When we begin to internalize that, begin to think about that, it changes our perspective. It, it makes us not want to whine about the little bitty inconvenient things that go on in life. It makes us focus on him and be thankful that he would afford so much cost for us as individuals. So, so when I think about Christ, you know, I hear the songs, he's my buddy and he's this and that. I see him as the holy sacrifice, of, uh, sacrificial lamb of God. So we, we must respond to him as our Passover sacrifice. At the same time, which is difficult, we must relate to him as our personal Savior. Which, again, it's hard to put the two together. I love Philippians 3, 8 and, uh, through 10. It says, I, Paul's writing to the, the Philippians, says, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord. And then on verse number 10, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. The concept of knowing Christ personally is a consistent theme in the New Testament. We see it over and over again. We, we see it intimately. We see it intently. We see, we, we see a close, intimate knowledge as our goal as we move through the, uh, through the, uh, the epistles. And... and you say, well, how can we do that? Well, the demonstration is, is back in the Passover lamb. Do you remember what would happen? The Jewish family, they would go out to the flock, and they would look around, and they would find the perfect little baby lamb. And, and they would get that little baby lamb. Maybe, they would, maybe it was already named. Samuel or Susan or lamb, not lamb chops, okay? That's a, yeah. but, but they would take that little baby lamb into the courtyard of their home. And for five days, they would, it was a male, a little boy lamb. They would wash him, examine him, cuddle him, hold him, feed him, care for him. Get to know that lamb. I mean, it's almost like a pet. And, and love that lamb. And then take it down to the temple and you know what? How do you get to know Jesus? I mean, how, how, do, how can we know him intimately like that? How can we examine him? How can we look at him? How, how, can, how can we draw close to him uh, like, like, it's, like it says here? Well, 
Philippians says that we fellowship with him in the in, in his suffering. Well, how do you do that? Go to the Gospels. In Matthew, he's our coming king. In Mark, he's our fellow servant leader. In, in Luke, he is our personal healer and savior. In John, he is a son of God who's, who saves us and, 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 and loves us so much that he would die for us. And as we read through the Gospels, as we, as we examine Christ in the Scriptures, we go closer and closer and closer to Him. Do you see? The more we get to know Him personally and what He does, then we have no choice but to stop and celebrate. Oh, Jesus, look what you've done. And we celebrate Jesus. So we, we, we've got to see Him as a sacrifice. We've got to see Him personally as our close personal Savior. But then, and I love this, we must recognize him as our predicted prophetic sovereign. In Revelation chapter 5, many of our small groups just went through studying Revelation, but in Revelation chapter 5, uh, John is raptured into heaven. So I saw a great door open, and I was caught up in the Spirit. And when he gets to heaven, the third heaven, he begins to look around and sees all kinds of things. But in verse number 6, I want, uh, he, 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 uh, he makes a description of something. I want to read it to you. And he said, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and, in, uh, and of the four living creatures, and of the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Who was that? Well, obviously, it's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here, John has been raptured up to heaven. He begins to describing these things. And then he sees Jesus. But when he sees Jesus, he sees him as a lamb that had been slain. I, he, he describes what he is seeing here. He's, he's a lamb. But in verse 5, when you go back and look at verse 5, it's a little bit confusing because he's seen as something else, a lion. And verse 5, it says, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. John was weeping because there was no one able to open the scroll. Do not weep. For the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. From that first Passover in Exodus until today, Jesus has been the predicted personal Passover lamb. He's been the lamb. But when he comes again, and receives us unto himself, and we look at him on the throne, not only will he be the sacrificed lamb, he will be the sovereign Lord, the Lion of Judah. And boy, things are going to change at that time. We see Jesus as a lion and the lamb, crucified, coming. And that changes us. When we recognize him for who he is, when we see what he has done, when we when we gain perspective, it does something on the inside of us that makes us want to worship, celebrate, sacrifice, serve, forget about the things of the world, look for His coming. And tonight's ministry rally, is we're going to have some opportunities for us to serve, for us to, 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 um, uh, to see how that we, we can do that. Let me end with a story. In, in June of 2005, there was a story that came out of NBC News, uh, Fox News, India Today, The Guardian, and ESPN, and all carried this same story. And after I heard the story, I went and read the story, and then I went back to fact checkers because I thought, man, the, can this be true? And the fact checkers verified the story as being true. So let me tell it to you. According to these news outlets, a little 12-year-old girl, a little 12-year-old Ethiopian girl, was walking home from school one day thinking about what she was going to have for dinner. She was very hungry, and she was just thinking about running into her mom and getting a snack and playing. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, four men ran up behind her, 
grabbed her and 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 began to wrestle her and 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 take her off. Witnesses say they watched as the little girl was screaming and kicking and crying and hitting them, and they stuffed her into a van and drove off. She was gone for a week. Uh, no one who could find her. They were searching for her, and then they the 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 four men were preparing to sell her into a forced marriage, and that's when she began kicking and fighting them again, and um, and they got fed up with it and began uh, beating and kicking and abusing her. And she fell down on the ground and began to cry. And suddenly out of the, the forest or out of the jungle came th- a pride of three lions. And they surrounded the men and started chasing the men and attacked the men and ran them off. They jumped in their car and drove off. And the three lions came and formed a circle around the little girl and just sit there and waited for nearly half a day until it was reported and the policeman and the girl's family came back to the site. And when they arrived, the three, the three lions got up walked back in the jungle, and she was restored to her home. And he said, could that actually happen? I'm telling you, I read it over, looked all the... Ch- and, and, and the animal uh, people said, here's, the, here's what must have happened. The lions thought the crying of the little girl sounded like a lion kitten uh, that had been injured, and they were surrounding to protect the little girl. I think that the Lord has given us this illustration. What do you think? Amen. <laughs> you know, I love the story because so many people that I care about have been taken captive. They've been ta- taken captive by sin, addiction, bitterness, anger, insecurity, materialism, a wounded spirit, damaged emotion. Satan is a kidnapper. He is a liar. He mentally and emotionally kidnaps us and, uh, and abuses us and brings us down and beats us down and oppresses and abuses us. But Jesus is the Lion of Judah who is about to come on the scene and it will be spectacular. We almost don't believe it. We see the world falling apart around us. Let me tell you, the lion is coming. When you begin to see the lion and the lamb crucified and coming, you will begin to celebrate Jesus. On behalf of Pastor Dan and the folks at Community, Thank you for joining us today at Community On Demand. Feel free to share this link with others, and please know you are always welcome to be our guest during a live service any Sunday morning at our campus in the Woodlands, Texas. For more information, just click on the link, www.cbcwoodlands.org. I hope you will again join us at Community On Demand.